preacher had his own uh, method of preparation. And usually when I finish here Friday night, I go home, I don't sleep much, but I try and get something from the Lord for the next Friday night. And if I haven't much to do on Saturday, I spend Saturday preparing for the next Friday night. But Sunday night I'm going to preach, uh, what I'm going to preach, Assembly of God Church. I, I think the favorite text of Pentecostals is, none of these things move me. Thank you. <laughs> but not many people want to be moved anymore. So I'm going to what? Assembly of God Church at Shady Grove. That's a bad name, isn't it? Shady Grove in uh, Dallas, I think. Six o'clock Sunday night. I want you all to come to sing. <laughs> he did such a good job tonight. The book of the Revelation. We're not going to stay here long in this part. Book of Revelation chapter 20. When I think of this book, I think of three things. To me, the book of Revelation is a book of majesty. It's a book of mystery. And it's a book of misery. Because it tells me about the end of time and it tells me about beyond the end of time. If your faith needs a lift now and again, don't keep forever running to Romans 8.28, you've worn that out. Want to get something inspiring? Why not get out of time into eternity? A preacher came to see me a few days ago. He said, you talk about the Puritans, you talk about Hawker and Owen and some of those majestic characters. What's the difference between those men in, in the 1600s and the men today? Oh, that's easy to answer. They lived in eternity, we live in time. Yeah. Yeah. We're so earthbound. We're always talking about numbers, the unsaved, the lost, never. That's right. But first of all, if you're going to get inspiration, we've got to look unto Jesus, the author and the finish of our faith. Yeah. This is an awesome chapter, chapter 20. Let me read from verse 11. And I saw a great white throne. Again, my quip is I'm reading from the King James Version, you know, the Living Bible. <coughs> <coughs> and I saw a great white throne and him that sat upon it, from whose face the heavens and the earth fled away. Can you think of anything more awesome than that? It doesn't say who sits on the throne. I believe God himself sits there. The believers, Paul says, we are going to be... We all of us are going to the judgment seat of Christ. This is not the judgment seat of Christ. This is the judgment seat of God. In this 20th chapter. From his face the heavens and the earth fled away, and there was found no place for them. And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God. And the books were opened, and another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books according to their works. The sea gave up the dead which were in it. Death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them. They were judged every man according to their works. And death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. Last Monday night I said to my wife, I said, sweetheart, I'm going to my office for a while. I opened my Bible at this chapter, I began to read it, I've read it often, maybe thousands of times over the years. But as I read this, suddenly it seemed as though this, uh, I felt like a man going down the road and he gets ambushed. There's somebody behind the bush and they grab hold of him and just make him look and listen. I read this last verse in the 20th chapter. Whosoever is not found written in the book of life, no, pardon me, the 14th verse, Death and hell were cast into the lake of fire, and this is the second death. It's mentioned again in the next chapter. The second death. You can listen to your TV and radio evangelist for ten years, you won't hear a sermon on the second death. They hardly dare preach on the first death, never mind the second one. Yeah. When did you last hear a sermon on TV about hell? About everlasting destruction? It's not fashionable. It doesn't bring the money in. 
doesn't tickle the ears, tickles the conscience. Whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. I sat at my desk and the tears began to pour down my face. The Lord shot the name of a man into my mind. I'd never seen the man in my life. I knew he used to be considerably wealthy. I don't know much about his name even. I know his son. I love his son very well. I began to think about that man with all his privileges in social life and everything, but his name is not in the book of life. And he's going to be participating in this second death. There's only one way to understand this, I think, and that is to go into the gospel recorded by, recorded by Luke and the, the 16th chapter. <clears throat> there are a lot of wonderful expositions of the, <clears throat> what we call the Sermon on the Mount. But they're called in the scripture the Beatitudes. Do you know why they call the Beatitudes? Without being facetious, because there should be the attitudes of every believer. Yeah. That's the normal Christian life, not the abnormal Christian life. Yeah. The normal Christian life is holiness. Amen. Outside of that, it's sickness. Right. Luke chapter 16. Again, I was going to say that, you know, when you come to, you read the, uh, what, Matthew 7... And you read through the Beatitudes and then suddenly you bump into Jesus saying something that you hadn't noticed about because three times in the Beatitudes it mentions hell. But we stress all the beautiful things about the Beatitudes. Verse 19 of chapter 16. There was a certain man which was clothed in purple and fine linen and he fed sumptuously or extravagantly every day. And there was a certain beggar named Lazarus, which laid at his gate full of sores. Now notice there are two, two beggars in this story. One begs in time and the other begs in eternity. The other is begging at the gates, in, hoping he can get a, a few crumbs. But you find a little later, in verse 24, that this man cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me. He's begging. Have mercy, have mercy. This shatters forever the idea you can pray to saints. This man prayed at the wrong time to the wrong person for the wrong thing and he got the wrong answer. Yes. There was a certain man named Lazarus laid at his gate full of sores, desiring to fed, be fed with the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table and moreover the dogs came and licked his sores. Well, they were kinder than the old rascal that had the money. He never helped him. It came to pass that the beggar died and what? What did he show in your version? He was carried. He was carried. The rich man died and was buried. There's no record that the, rich, the poor man was ever buried. He was more, most likely taken to Gehenna, the place where they dumped all the offal and the dirt and the filth in that valley where the worms didn't ever die and the fires never went out. But the rich man had an ostentatious funeral. I was going to say maybe he was a mason, but there weren't masons then, but it was a show. Richest man in town. I remember when I came to America for the first time in 1950, there was a, the, the, uh, the funeral of a gangster I happened to see there in Chicago. Good night. You just thought it was Julius Caesar they were burying. No. They had crosses longer than the, two, uh, longer than the casket. They had open... Uh, what do you call them? Carriages behind, stacked with flowers. Thousands of dollars worth of flowers. A wicked, violent man who'd been involved in murders and rape and bootlegging and every devilish thing. You, and they gave him the wedding of a, they gave him the funeral of a king. Now, which is best to be to, to be carried or to be buried? I thought I was going to be carried away tonight when you were singing, but I knew it wouldn't be because you wouldn't have got this great truth. But anyhow. <laughs> It came to pass the beggar died and was carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom, which that was a Jewish conception of heaven. The rich man also died and was buried. And heavy lifted up his eyes, being in torments. And he seeth Abraham afar. You know that thing got hold of me? 
it still has hold of me. This man is in torment. You've heard me say more than once, I'm going to heaven and I'm not going for the weekend. And some of you are going to hell and you're not going for the weekend. I didn't have time. I'd like to have had a piece of paper put across here with this printed in big letters on it tonight so you would see it. Hell has no exits. We read of heaven, there are twelve gates into heaven. It doesn't say there are any gates into hell. It's just, it's, Jesus says, quoting what? Uh, I think it's the fifth chapter in Isaiah which he quoted most often from that chapter. Hell hath enlarged her mouth to swallow the generations, to swallow the people that think they're secure and happy. It doesn't say much about this rich man except that he was rich. The poor man sat at his gate, everybody despised, rejected, forgot about him. The rich man was cast down. <clears throat> the poor man went into Abraham's bosom. Notice what it says carefully here. In hell he lifted up his eyes, being in torments, and he seeth. He seeth. Do you know people in hell can see? If you were to pull that blind away, don't do it well. But if you did, and there were some people standing out there, they could see in here and say, well, that's Brother Raymond, that's Sister Somebody. Those people in darkness can see everything that's going on in this room. I can't see a thing. Somebody might be choking a man out there. Somebody might have a revolver at his head. I can't see. But he that's out in the darkness, the total darkness, can see everybody in here. I believe one of the perpetual torments, remember, it's not going to pass in a weekend. I believe everybody goes to hell will see everything that's going on in heaven. Verse 23, he seeth, he lifted up his eyes being in torments, so he's very conscious. You know, some people try to say, well, uh, there isn't such a thing as hell. A few minutes after the man gets angry, he says, go to hell. What's he saying? Go to nowhere? Jesus spoke about hell ten times. He spoke about heaven only once. We need to recover our balance. I've said to you over and over again, we are, we are not eternity conscious enough. Twelve gates into the city of God, only one way into hell. No exits. It says they go in and out of the city, but nobody went in and out of hell. It says there's a new heaven and a new earth. It never says there's a new hell and a new devil. I told you about a man that lived in a city that I lived in before I was born by the name of Charlie Pease. He was the Al Capone of our nation. He raped, he robbed, he did every devilish thing. And the cops couldn't get him, but once they got him, he was sentenced to death in the city where I lived. And the judge said to him, you'll hang by the neck until you die, and God have mercy on your soul. Charlie Pease was put in a cell with a guard watching him every moment because in English law at that time, a man was given 20, 21 days, three weeks, what was called amendment of life or repentance. And he was guarded day and night so he didn't commit suicide and beat the law. The night before he used to go to the gallows, an officer came in and said, Mr. Pease, and he stood up and said, Yes, I'm Mr. Pease, I'm Charlie. Is that a name for a criminal? I'm Mr. Pease. <clears throat> well, he said in the morning, he said, Yes, at 8 o'clock, I go to the gallows put a rope round his neck, put him on a trap door, pull a switch, he drops down there and he's killed quicker than being executed. He never failed. Quarter of eight in the morning, the judge came, the prison governor came in, the prison doctor came in, the hangman who was peer point came in, and a preacher came to say a little prayer. He said a mouldy, miserable little prayer. Then he began to walk towards the scaffold, a little room, he had to go through a door, and Charlie Pease was following, and a man was reading. And suddenly he mentioned hell. Oh yes, he mentioned heaven, about streets of gold and angels and everything. Then he mentioned hell. Charlie Pease reached for the, for the preacher and spun him around and said, what are you reading? Well, he said, I'm reading from a, 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 a book called The Consolations of Religion. Consolations? 
I'm not concerned about heaven. I'm not going. You just said a minute ago that hell is a bottomless pit. You say that hell is fire that never goes out. You say hell is a death that never dies. Do you mean that when I swing on that rope, something goes out of me, away into what you call eternity, and my body goes down into that quick line? But something gets out of me before I get down to the bottom. Are you telling me that I, Charlie Peace, will be eternally burning and never consumed, eternally dying and never die, eternally in the grip of death and never feel relief? I'm going to be in eternal agony forever and ever? Well, the preacher said, that's what I was taught at school. I don't care what you were taught, he said. I'm asking you, do you believe in a hell like that, where people never, never, ever die? Uh, well, I, I, I think it'll... Where Charlie Peace said that was, the city of Leeds is in the middle of England, northern England. Over here you have Liverpool, over there you have Hull. Charlie Peace said if you covered the, the ground between Hull, uh, Hull and, and uh, Liverpool, thank you. If you covered it with broken glass and made me crawl on my hands and knees, leaving a trail of my own blood behind me, and I could snatch just one man from that eternal hell, I would say, Charlie Peace, you've done well. I hear people say, you know, one of the signs of the last days is all this heresy. The Jehovah's Witnesses don't believe in hell. The Mormons don't believe in hell. Mooniites don't believe in hell. I've got news for you. You don't believe in hell either. We've got a crowded house for once in six months. Normally you can get a chair anywhere you like. Are you suggesting to me that either this school or any other school around here would live its normal course if we all believe that men outside of Jesus Christ are going to perish forever and ever and ever? Come on now, here's a man. And all his life he went to church. When they made appeals, he pulled out a checkbook. He's very generous, a soft touch, as you say. He'd give to missions, he'd give to other things. But he died unsaved. He had a fine service. The preacher told lies over him, as they often do when they bury people. And he wakes up in hell, and, one, and he looks there into eternity, and there's his precious wife. He's scorned and ridiculed and laughed at. And she's at the marriage supper of the Lamb, and he's going to burn forever and ever? That's what the Word of God says. He sees in the bosom of Abraham, he sees Lazarus there. I went to a lovely wedding last week. And the bride came down the aisle looking so gorgeous. And I was, I tried to pronounce the benediction, at least I tried to pray. But you know, I suddenly got caught away in that thing. I recognized this sweet young lady in beautiful white. And then I visualized the married supper of the Lamb with millions and millions and millions of people there. And singing such as you've never heard because there's 144,000 in the orchestra. Again, not with guitars, thank God. <laughs> <laughs> with harps. I've told you what guitars are, the backslidden harps. <laughs> Can you imagine a choir, a multitude which no man can number, and 144,000 in the orchestra? Singing with rapturous delight and watching the bride come? Who is she? She's the bride of brides who's going to be married to the king of kings. And there's a man moldy in hell. And he's looking back and thinking how many times I laughed when my wife talked about that. How many times I heard a preacher, I thought it was too far out. I thought it was a kind of a fairy story. Everybody who goes to hell will be able to recite every word of every sermon they ever heard since they were a child. The agony of hell is there's no way out. The agony of hell is that we'll have the sharpest memories we ever had if we get there. He seeth Abraham in the bosom. He says the man in the bosom of Abraham, other words, in heaven. And he prays. What does he pray? 
In verse 23, you, you, you notice that he can see. In hell he lifted up his eyes, being in torments. Oh, that conscience he smothered now, it feels like a spark of hell itself inside of him. Verse 23 he can see. Verse 24 he can hear. Because Abraham spoke to him. Verse 24, he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus. He may dip, uh, dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue. Look, that man's going to be chewing his own tongue for a million years and he'll see people sitting at the marriage supper of the Lamb drinking the wine of the ages. He has an appetite, but he, there's nothing to satisfy. All his life he lusted for women and now he can't celebrate his lust. If you think men aren't idiots, why in God's name do you think they get AIDS? They say it's the most cruel thing that men have ever experienced. It's even more painful than a woman having an agonizing time in childbirth. But that period of AIDS he has for three years, he won't live more, be old, more than three years with it, it's just a foretaste, not of glory divine, it's a, glo a foretaste of eternal misery. He's got hell on the way to hell. The devil's a bad taskmaster. send Lazarus that he may he recognize Lazarus. I tell you, if you go to hell, you recognize people. You see your preacher, you wish to God he'd come and preach to you once more. You'll hear your mother praying, I wish to God you'd, you'd been sensible when she was praying. You remember that every time your conscience began to tremble and you smothered it. You remember when the fear of God came on you, but the fear of man crowded out the fear of God. Come on now, hell is eternal. There's no escape. There's no way out. I went to a devil's island just off the coast of South America once, near Venezuela. I went across with the officers from the prison on a beautiful yacht. And I said, well, this is some place. I noticed this great big prison of yours has no bars around it. No, 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 no. The men are walking around the edge. Don't they ever try, don't they jump in the water? One, only one man in history ever got out of this prison. This sea is the most shark infested sea there is anywhere in the Americas. One man did it, only one. Usually the sharks are there, usually there's a patrol boat. When the man up there sees a man dive in the water, he, sound, he sounds a buzzer and he also sends a message to the coast of America and they send a patrol boat out. The man who escaped had been a, a champion swimmer. And the reason he escaped was every time he kicked and kicked and the sharks didn't come. Every time he saw a boat or somebody coming in, he swam underwater. He said he swam underwater for miles, coming up and down, up and down, up and down. But he made it. But no man has ever escaped the eternal judgment of God. Again, they go in and out of the city of God. Nobody ever went in and out of hell just then. Say what you like. Every true revival. I know we don't preach it today. We're smooth. We're careful. I see people half naked in some places. Well, you see, we go into these uh, camps with these young people and we dress like them uh, uh, to win them. I suppose some of you boys are praying you get called to a nudist colony. Well, if you're going to dress like them to win them, you'd have to go without anything on. It's the very opposite. We don't rest like them to win them. That's the very opposite that we do. Well, we, we do the opposite of that. You cannot find me a generation of preachers. You can have who you like. That hasn't had a revival at some time. And one of the main supports in that, theological supports in that revival has been preaching on hell. Moody preached on it very much. Again, I read to you the other week where the greatest revival in the history of America was 17, what, 27? Through Jonathan Edwards. Maybe the greatest genius America ever had. Went to school at University of Yale at nine. At 13 years of age, he became the uh, he, uh, valedictarian. And he went on and on. But it was in the course of an ordinary series of meetings when revival broke out 
he knew that George Whitfield was coming later, but didn't say we're going to have a big meeting and we're going to stage Whitfield and get some good singers. And it was in the ordinary course of a preaching service. But remember, this man, according to his daughter at nine years of age, says, people think my daddy has a, has a, a face of granite and a voice of gravel. And he preached, you remember that message, of sinners in the hands of an angry God. And all they know is my daddy thundering. I wish to God we'd somebody could thunder these days. Yeah. Everybody's teaching. Do you know why teaching? Because it doesn't get to your conscience. It doesn't disturb you. We want somebody to sit nice and be comfortable and just talk to us. America's going to hell on, on, on about 13 feet of teaching tapes from the coast of the, from Canada down to the Gulf. Did you read today or hear today about this horrible thing that happened? Right after this super accident that they had down in Mexico City, and now about 60 miles east of Bogota, the capital of Colombia, a volcano that hasn't spewed out for 400 years except one little freak about 100 years ago, and it blew the top and melted all the snow in the mountains and sent a tidal wave of 13 feet deep that's wiped out towns. 20,000 people have perished. The people say, isn't it awful? Isn't it awful? They've lost their furniture. Come on. Supposing you look at it from God's angle. Most of the Catholics, they didn't know God. 20,000 people gone to hell. Well, we listen to the news, as thought we were, you know, just going to smoke and relax. 15,000 people perished there in Mexico City. Many of the thousands not even be discovered. They went straight to perdition, most of them. Tonight they showed children just plastered with dirt and plastered with blisters because the villages near the volcano felt the fiery blast as though the door of hell had opened and the skin came off the people. And there they are in their misery. Well, if you translate that again into this thing that's mentioned here in the Word of God, this man has spent all this time getting nothing. Again, quoting that old chorus, turn your eyes upon Jesus, look full in his wonderful face, and the things of earth will grow strangely dim. I turn it round and say, when you get to eternity and look back, you'll discover you spent most of you spent your life gathering sawdust. The things of earth from eternity won't look strangely, strangely dim, they'll look strangely grim. You see, this man prays. He doesn't pray about his sins. He doesn't even pray to be delivered. He just says, send Lazarus that he may dip his finger in water and cool my parched tongue. I am tormented in this flame. Wouldn't it be something for a man to sit there in hell where there's no rest, there's no peace, and suddenly he looks up and he sees his, his wife at the marriage supper of the Lamb or his wife in that marvelous thing that's mentioned where well, is it Matthew 7 where they sit down with Abraham and Isaac and all the saints of all the ages and he sees his wife with a glorified body he sees her with resurrection life he sees her with a majesty he never dreamed that he'd ever see her in and here he is in his perpetual misery and there's going to be no change for him I'm tormented Tormented with my memory. Tormented with the times I rejected God. Tormented with the times he offered me some service and I didn't do it. Tormented with my guilt. It's come alive now more than ever. I'm tormented in this flame. Mine. I say again, I believe you, re you remember every sermon he ever heard preached. You remember every time the Spirit of God was tugging at his conscience and he said no. Isn't it amazing that an omnipotent God will let you smack him in the face? He struggled with you so often. And he hasn't destroyed you because you disobeyed him. There's a hymn that says, Depth of mercy, can there be mercy still reserved for me? Can my God his wrath forbear? Me the chief of sinners spare? 
I had long withstood his grace, long provoked him to his face, would not hearken to a call, grieved him by a thousand falls. Isn't that your history? Be honest about it. Did you really get saved the very first time you heard the gospel? I heard the gospel a hundred times. And yet I was only 14 when I got saved. I was only 18 when I got filled with the Spirit. I'm glad I went to a church where holiness was stressed. I'm glad one day somebody pushed a little book into my hands. The life of a great American, one of the greatest Americans that ever lived. You know him, David Brainerd. He died at 28. Do you know it's killing America, killing Christians, creature comforts. Our beds are too comfortable, our homes are too comfortable. You know, some people think that they're, they're fasting and they're really crucifying the flesh if they don't have a Coke for two days. Or Dr. Pepper is whatever your weakness is. You know, we're the most undisciplined generation the world's ever known. I saw a boy in a church not long ago, I said, well, how old are you? He said, Oh, I'm 16. See that fellow there? I'm discipling him. You know what? A kid 16 discipling a boy 14? Disciple comes from the word discipline. How many of you are disciplined? How many go to bed at the same time every night? Get up every morning at the same time? How do you discipline your appetite? How do you discipline your tongue? We've the most weak, effeminate Christianity the world's ever had. No, but no wonder nobody wants it. It has no strength. It has no character. It has no... I'm going to use an old word, but I won't use it. Let me go back to this a minute. Abraham said, Son, remember... You say, well, Mr. Raymond, that doesn't worry me too much. Well, it doesn't. Well, you say, I never had a very good memory. You know, sometimes, I don't see TV often, but I used to like to watch these tests that they give kids, one school competing against another, you know, and ask uh, who Alexander III married or something. And they say, this is an intelligence test. It's nothing of the kind. It's a memory test. If you have a good memory, you can get through. It's a memory test. Son, remember. You say, I don't have a very good memory. Well, let me tell you something. I think the psychologists see the little thing down here called the repress, in the repress complexity of the subconscious. In one of the great hospitals in Canada a few years ago, they put some, I forgot what they called the things on a, on a guy's temples. Electrodes. And they turned his mind back and asked him what he did when he was 11 years of age. And he, he, he just went through everything he did from 11 to 12. What did he do when he was 16? He went back. His mind all came back. It was replayed. Well, you say, I don't have a mind like that. But listen, wait till the resurrection finger of Jesus Christ touches he will have. When Themistocles was the mayor of Athens in Greece there, there were 200,000 people in the city and he knew the name of every one of them. One of the greatest generals in the world had over 115,000 soldiers in his army. They said he could recall the name of everyone. But he says, son, remember, remember, remember. In your lifetime you had your good things. You were privileged to live in a Christian country. You went to a good church. You had godly parents. Remember all the good things you had and you, you treated them as though they were dust or dung? You can't have them back now. Son, remember. Remember the missed opportunities. Remember the times you denied the Holy Ghost the right to come further into your life. Remember, remember every time conscience worked with the touch of God on it. Son, remember in your lifetime. All the warnings. All the pleadings. Pleadings with, by men, pleading by God, pleadings by your relatives, ple pleadings by the preachers. And you turn them all, all, all away. 
Remember them now. Come on, let them torment you. Then look at your wife there. There she is with that holy group of people forever and ever. He says, send him that he may touch my tongue. His, wi his wife is going to drink of the waters of life from the middle of the city of God. And this man is going to be writhing in pain and agony and he could have been with her. But business stole him. Sports stole him. Some of you men will be ten miles further up the road if you haven't watched so much TV on football, football on TV. Time you've wasted. You can't get it back. I remember once when I was working with Dr. Fawcett in England, one day he held his watch up. He said, Len, you see this thing? God will forgive you. This thing won't. You passed it up. Remember, son, in your lifetime. So his lifetime is over. One of the great hymns written in America was written in uh, the Great North Church there in Boston. I preached there once. And I asked them to sing it, My Faith Looks Up to Thee. It was written by uh, an elder in the church, and the tune was put into the hymn by the organist of the church. My Faith Looks Up to Thee. Do you remember the last stanza? Maybe you don't. I'll tell you what it says. In the last stanza it says this, When ends life's transient dream, When death's cold sullen stream shall o'er me roll, Blessed Saviour, then in love, fear, and distrust remove, Oh, bear me safe above a ransom soul. When ends life's transient dream? We have a little creature in England like a rat, but it has a beautiful coat. It's called a mole. And, and men trap them, and then they have them skinned, and they, they make ladies' coats. They're very beautiful. You can see a mole going on the, on the street or, or in a field. Pick it up. Why, why doesn't it run away? Because it's blind. But if you hit it and kill it, its eyes open. It's blind all its life. Its eyes are open immediately, it dies. You know, that's a tragedy with millions of people. They'll go through life blind, blind to God, blind to God's righteousness, blind to his justice, blind to his holiness, blind to his commandments. And in a moment of time, they'll wake up in hell. What's the condition of America like spiritually tonight? Zero. Why? Because we've got blind men coming out of seminaries. The men there don't teach them. They don't hear a word about hell. They're blind themselves, and they, as blind men, they lead the blind, and they go to hell. <coughs> Send me, may dip the tip of his finger in water, and cool my tongue, for I am tormented in this flame. my Bible here. Testament a minute. <coughs> Matthew 7. <coughs> Matthew 7 in verse 15 it says, Beware of false prophets, they come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravening wolves. And verse 21 says, Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. And then he will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name, and in thy name have cast out devils, and in thy name do many mighty things? Verse 23 says, Then will I profess unto them, I never knew me, ye workers of iniquity. Depart from me. Remember the first word of Jesus was what? Come unto me. His last word is depart from me. And he's saying it to preachers. He's saying it to miracle workers. He's saying it to men that have bled money by the millions of dollars out of people. And they're going to say, We prophesied in thy name. Isn't that something? They said we did it in thy name. He said you're workers of iniquity. <coughs> you did it in my name to exalt your name. I never knew you. You say that God knows all things. Yes, he does. He's of holy rise and to behold iniquity. 
Well, then, didn't he know what they were doing? Sure, he watched every miracle they did. But he said, I never knew you in a love relationship. You were professional preachers. You never had a love, a, a love relationship with me. You never worshipped me. You were so busy with an external ministry. You were so busy running here and there. No time for God. Come on, how much time have you spent with Jesus today? When you last go to him and say, I'm not going to ask you for a thing. I've come to worship you in spirit and in truth. You can go to conferences all over the country. You may go till you're as old as I am, and I'm almost 80. So some of you have a few years to go. I remember the first time Dr. Tosa said to me, he said, you know, Brother Len, I have never heard a sermon on worship in my life. Well, I happen to be 79 years of age, and I've been going to church to meetings for 75 years. I've never heard a message on worship. But also active in the outer court, serving the people in the outer court, we never get into the Holy of Holies. In, in, the, in, the, in the outer court there is daylight. In the holy place there is candlelight. In the holy of holies there is no light. Pitch black. No windows. As black as blackness can be. Gross darkness. And it stays like that unless the glory of God comes. But when the shekinah comes it's blinding. You know why we don't miss the glory of God? Because we've never seen it, that's why. We're so used to meetings, we're so used to being happy. We're used to some dumb guy getting up there and let's all stand and raise your hands and worship. You don't worship God standing up, you worship God on your belly. Side two. Every time they worship, from Abraham down to the Revelation, every time they worship, they worship off face downward. And then again, Dr. Tosa said one day, Len, let other people do what they like. You and I will worship God face downward. If you're down on your face, you can't get distracted with anything round about. But it's only when we're in the Holy of Holies, in the holy place. Do you not know worship is? Speechless adoration. We're going to be startled when we get to heaven and see some people get far bigger rewards than the big TV boys and these boys that run around the world. I have all due respect for World Challenge. What about Van Challenge? Hmm? What about Tyler Challenge? Jesus said, begin at Jerusalem. That's the hardest place, isn't it? In your own church, in your own home, in your own life. I've told you, but Dr. Tozer said, Len, I come in my office at 8 in the morning and I lay on my belly till 9, 10, 11, 12, and even 1 o'clock. Five hours, and I've not said one word of prayer, and I've not said one word of praise. What do you do? Adoring him. Concentrating on his majesty, concentrating on his holiness, concentrating not just when I sing, Great is thy faithfulness. Very lovely. When you last tell God that on your belly, by yourself, you look at his faithfulness. He didn't cut you off when you committed that horrible sin. He extended his mercy, he extended his peace, he extended his joy. Do you wonder the Apostle Paul, the man I think lived nearer to God than anybody else except the Son of God, he said, with all I have from him, and he drew more from God than anybody, but he says, I'm a debtor to all men. Does it take a mystery meeting to stir you up with, with compassion for the lost? He won't if you go to hell. He won't if you realize that there's a million roads into hell, there's no way out. It's going to be the permanent residence for billions of years, for billions of people. Oh, but we stay home and we get excited. We give a few tracts out. It'd do a lot of us a lot more good if we stayed home on our bellies and worshipped and listened to God. I'm not saying you can't learn at school. You can. You usually don't learn too much. A man called me tonight and he said, Brother Raymond, I want to tell you about my situation. He said, I've just started preaching in a church. And he said, after I preached the first night, an old deacon struck and said, listen, we're not doing it that way. We've done it this way for 20 years. He said, I've been in this pastor for two years. I came overflowing with joy from, from the seminary. But he said, I've learned more about people in two months in this church than three years in seminary. Because he comes right up to people who don't want to be moved in God. They want... It, Eternal security become infernal security.
You say, well, I believe in one saved, always saved. Well, tell me this in God's name. Do you believe in one lost, always lost? Once you get through the gates there into hell, it's forever and ever. One lost, always lost. There's no mercy there. There's no grace there. There's no pity there. Right. It's all agony. It's, it's everything that's antagonistic to God. I'll tell you what kind of company you're going to have. You know, people say, well, uh, don't take it too literally. Hell isn't really literal. Uh, because if hell's literal, of course, you couldn't be burning forever and ever. Couldn't you? No, flesh burns. Are you sure? Well, logically, forget the logic. I happen to know three boys that went into a furnace, and they burned a long time, but they didn't roast. You say, well, I'm going through the fire. Do your world of good. Don't come to me and ask for prayer. I won't pray for you. You're going through the fire. You know what it's going to do? What did it for the three Hebrew children? Their hands were bound, and they didn't have a pen knife. And the feet were bound. And they couldn't cut it, so the Lord sent the fire of the devil, and he, he liberated them. Isn't it nice when... Oh, you won't... you say it's crazy anyhow. Of course, you made your mind up about that ten minutes ago, but that's all right. Do you really believe that God would employ the devil to make you into a saint? Yes. Oh, but God protects us. He promises he'll do this. Yeah, Jesus says, Hi, Peter, how are you? Uh, fine. Uh, well, I've got some news for you, Peter. When you get down the road there, Satan's going to jump on you. Satan has desired thee to sift his wheat. That's what he was going to do. But I said, Satan, you'll go back to hell and leave my precious child Peter alone. No, he said, you need Satan to work in your life. Our dear principal told us he'd been preaching in a village church and as he came home, you won't know anything about this, I guess. As he came down from the church to go catch the little choo-choo that would take him back home, he passed the gate of, a, he passed the door, actually, of a, uh, a blacksmith. Typical old blacksmith there, pumping away to get the furnace going. And he had a man called a striker, he had a big hairy chest, barrel chested fellow, and he had a huge hammer with a big head on it. And the blacksmith pointed to something and he took it by the, he took that piece of metal with a pair of tongs and put it in the fire. You know, it's a good illustration there. You know, first of all, when you get saved, <coughs> God puts you in the fire. If you stay long enough, the fire gets into you. I remember watching a blacksmith. They put a piece of metal into the furnace. A black bar would go in. And then it'd pull it out after a little while. And it was getting whiter and whiter. And then it'd pull it out. In fact, when it stayed right in the heart of the fire, you couldn't tell the difference between the fire and the metal. But there's an anvil, you know, with a, a point at the end. The man gets hold of that piece of metal, he puts it in, he has a tiny hammer, just about this length, but when a boy could not, and he hit like that, and this big blacksmith comes and he blasts right down on that piece of metal like that. He puts it in the fire and he takes it out. Puts it in the fire and he puts it in water to temper it, as they say. And the more it goes in the fire, the more it goes in the water, it becomes a better quality of material. But little by little, something was being worked into this piece of iron. And Mr. Chadwick said, I watched, I watched that big man swinging that great big hammer till his chest was beads of perspiration, and it was running with perspiration. And he said, I said to the blacksmith, sir, why don't you change jobs? Why don't you do some of the heavy work? Why don't you let him touch the metal with that little hammer? And he said, he smiled, he said, you know, the blacksmith, I he said, no, what are you, a preacher? Oh... Well, that explains the dullness, of course. A preacher. But he said, sir, that man's getting tired. He's been beating with that hammer, knocking... Yeah, yeah. He said, but do you know what? He doesn't really know what he's doing. I have a contract to make a pair of gates for a mansion that's been built miles away from here. Notice how this metal's beginning to turn and get beautiful. Look at those gates. There's one gate finished. It's all curls in it, even got flowers on it that I made out of metal. All I do, I, I just point there, and if I point once, 
If a man hits the medal this way for point twice, he hits it that way. If I make another sign, he hits it so it bends over the end. And he says, I'm the designer. I pay him just to knock this metal into shape. And it doesn't worry him. He works all day smashing away at this metal. And Mr. Chadwick said to the blacksmith, Thank you, sir. That was a wonderful sermon. What do you mean a wonderful sermon? He said, The devil's been hitting me for the last two weeks. Now I say, God says, Hit Chadwick there. He needs, he needs a bit of stuff knocking up in there. <laughs> And then hit Chadwick this way. You, you won't knock him out of shape. You knock him into shape. Huh? Don't you ever think of him hidden in the hollow of his blessed hand? Never fall can follow. Never try to stand. Do you really believe or is it just a little theological thing stuffed in your head? Do you believe your, your life is hid with Christ in God? No matter how tough the road is. One of the best modern hymns in America was written by a woman that had a terrible, terrible life of sickness. But she wrote a hymn, He giveth no grace as the burdens go greater. Do you know that? How many know it? Would you like to sing it for us? Yes. Oh, okay. He giveth no grace as the burdens go greater. He giveth more strength as the labors increase. Try the affliction, he addeth his mercy. To multiplied trials is multiplied pace. Lord, give me more strength. Why give you more strength? You're not carrying any load. When you get to the situation where you need the strength, he'll give you all the strength you need. Yes. He'll give you the wisdom you need. He'll give you the vision you need. You see, it takes God an awful long while to mature us. I know, because I've been on the road a long while. I got saved when I was 14. I'm 79. And you know what? I haven't arrived yet. Oh, when I was your year, age, I had. <laughs> When I was your age, I knew everything. I pitied my father. He wasn't very well educated. But after I got educated, I envied my father. So simple, so pure, so passionate, so prayerful. I never saw a preacher weep. My daddy would get down and groan and weep and travel for lost men and women. There's a big husky man about five feet eleven and proportionately built. And I began to realize that you don't get smart, just well, you can get smart. See, we, we, we confuse knowledge with wisdom. Yeah. But knowledge isn't wisdom. Right. Wisdom is, is knowing how to apply knowledge for one thing. Yeah. I've got a son got an own PhD. His wife has an own PhD. They're very, very smart. I smiled the other day. I said to Martha, I see people are paying $10,000 uh, to have dinner with Princess Di and Prince Charles. Our son in West Africa got an invitation for nothing and he wouldn't go. You see, I mean, you look down on royalty when you're a child of a king. <laughs> no, but there's a wisdom which is from above. Which supersedes all the wisdom of men. <laughs> the three Hebrew children were burned and burned. No, they were not burned at all. All the fire did was burn off the shackles of the world, put on them. Don't the beast and the prophet go down into the pit and they burn and burn and burn for a thousand years and they're still as correct as the same as when they went in? You know, again, and let me say this cliche, I like it. Because I didn't write it, but I like it. You know, Christianity is not, N-O-T, not been weighed in the balances and found wanting. It's been tried, found difficult, and rejected. Again, Jesus isn't looking for you, for you to bring all your lousy sins to him. What do you think he does with them? He wants you. He wants your heart, he wants your mind, he wants your will, he wants your emotions. Every part of you to be filled with God. Let me tell you the company, if you go to hell, they're all listed here. I'll read it for you. Revelation 21. And verse 7 says, He that overcometh shall inherit all things. You know, with such sloppy theology, everybody that's saved is going to be in the bride of Christ. Don't believe it for a minute. I don't believe that. How did God make, an, uh, make a bride for Adam? 
Did he take all of Adam? He took a part of Adam. And when Jesus comes for the bride, he's not going for every believer, I'm assured of that. What makes us get so arrogant and feel so secure that we're so holy and wonderful? Listen, if you can't stand a, an extra long sermon, if you, if you hear me often enough, you'll hear them. If you get uncomfortable after an hour's preaching, what in God's name are you going to do in the millennium or in eternity? I preached in a fashionable church out west, east some years ago. First Sunday morning, five minutes to twelve, the lady goes like this, you know, so nice. And she got up and walked out. She did it the next Sunday morning. I said to Pastor, that, that old girl went down again this morning. Oh, she's done that for the last five years. I said, well, she won't do it once again. <laughs> well, what will you do? Uh, uh, I said, I'll speak with her. Five minutes to twelve, the third Sunday, she got up to walk. I said, hey, lady. <laughs> Where are you going? She said. I said, lady, if you can't stand an hour in the presence of God, what are you going to do in eternity? I know you walk out every Sunday. What are you going to do to heaven? You get bored with angels. You get bored with, bored with angels. You get bored with worship. You get bored with adoration. You get bored with the blazing holiness of God. Where are you going to walk out? To hell? It's the only alternative you have. I preached all next week. She never came once to hear me. Some people are easily offended. <laughs> Do you know what they did the other day? The snobs were snobbish, being snobbish to the snobs down there. Because uh, to have dinner with the que uh, prince and his girlfriend or his wife, $10,000. To have your photographs taken, was it five or fifty? Fifty thousand dollars. Now listen, you can have yours take with me this week for fifty dollars, never mind fifty thousand. <laughs> but imagine fifty thousand dollars to have your picture taken. I remember we were working in Teen Challenge twenty years ago. We went at midnight to the uh, opera house. It's it's not the same one today. We got there, men were coming out, they had their toppers, you know. Uh, my Rolls is over there. And they were bringing Rolls Royces and all the cars you can imagine. And the ladies were there sparkling with diamonds. <laughs> Do you know why? They rented them the day before. <laughs> Trailing mink and rabbit and all kinds of furs they had on. And, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, snobbish. Isn't there a social register in America of 400 outstanding people, families? Can you imagine those people waking up in hell with harlots and thieves and the underworld? Hmm? You know, there are no tears in heaven and there are no smiles in hell. There's no sorrow in heaven, there's no joy in hell. I'll tell you who lives in hell. The fearful, the unbelievers, the abominable, the murderers, the whoremongers, the sorcerers, the liars. They all have their part in the lake which burns with fire. And in verse, chapter 22, 15 of Revelation, it says, uh, Without are dogs, and sorcerers, and whoremongers, and murderers, and idolaters, and whoso loveth and maketh a lie. I've said to you often, i said it again tonight, one of the tragedies of modern Christianity, we've lost sight of the holiness of God. I don't care what meeting you go to. How often do you go tiptoeing out of the sanctuary because you could be overwhelmed with God's holiness, God's majesty, God's purity? Hmm? And because we've lost sight of the holiness of God, we've lost sight of the sinfulness of men. These men are going to be in eternal rebellion forever and ever. In heaven they're going to sing with singing you've never had no idea what it's like. And 144,000 hearts. In, hell they, in heaven they sing the song of Moses and of the Lamb. What do they sing in hell, I'll tell you. They sing the end of chapter 8 of Jeremiah. The harvest is past, the summer is ended, and we're not saved. We talk about Jonathan Edwards. No one hardly, hardly ever mentions his uh, brother-in-law, Aaron Burr. One of the great scholars of the day. Aaron Burr missed the presidency of the United States by one vote. 
Years afterwards, somebody said to him, well, Mr. Burr, you almost became the President of the United States. You missed it by one vote, didn't you? But I want to tell you something. There's something far greater than being a President of the United States. What is that? Well, you can be a Christian. No, I can't. Yes, you can. I can't. Yes, you can. Whosoever will may come. No, 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 he said, that's not for me. It's for everybody. No, it isn't. Well, why isn't it, Mr. Burr? I miss the presidency of the United States by one vote, sure. I was in a gospel meeting X number of years ago. And the evangelist said, there's one more people who should come to this altar today. And I was a man I didn't go. You should come. Today, if you will hear it, you know, we say to people, don't put it off. If you get an invitation to have dinner at the White House next Monday at 1 o'clock, Will you say, uh, I'm sorry I can't come, but I'll come Thursday at one? We treat God as always an errand boy. God doesn't owe a thing to anybody in this room tonight. He's pled with you, he's urged you, he's called you to holiness, he's called you to purity, he's called you to kiss this world goodbye with all of its pleasure, its pomp and its pride, and embrace the cross and follow the Lamb with us wherever he goes. And you'd rather stay in your own miserable situation. Aaron Byrne said, Burr said he'd call me. But I said to him that night, now God, I hear my famous brother-in-law, Jonathan Edwards, I hear other preachers. I want to make a deal. He said, if you promise to leave Aaron and Burr alone, I promise I won't bother you. And he said, from that day to this, Almighty God has never bothered me, never troubled me. And he's not speaking, he's not calling me. I dare not pretend to come. You know, it's no fun preaching. People think it is. I go to bed tonight, whatever I'll go, what, 12 o'clock, 1 o'clock maybe? I see this congregation or any other congregation I preach to. Do you know the curse of this day is time to get quick results so we can send letters out and say, we've had a good crusade, we've been here, we've been there, and so on they're being saved. That's balderdash. The greatest revival that came to America was when a bunch of men, again, Jonathan Edwards and the other men with him, joined hands and said, by the grace of God, we will never pluck unripe fruit. We will never press people to decision because these were his own words. We lead them to damnation and not to salvation. Right. Oh, we had a good meeting and people said, we asked them, would you want to serve Jesus? <coughs> Why do you ask them if you want to go to heaven? Ask them if you want to go to hell. There's far more to repentance than saying, I'm sorry. Yeah. Yeah. A famous preacher around here said to me long ago, you know, what we need to do as believers is live in repentance every day. I said, forget it. Do you want me to repent for adultery? I haven't committed it today or any other day. Do you want me to repent of lying? Do you want me to repent of stealing? It's not a case of living in repentance. It's a case of living in brokenness. Yeah. The perpetual challenge to the believer is come down from the cross and save yourself. Why should you fast when other people are feasting? Why should you be down there breaking your heart, weeping for revival when other people are over there having a good time and living it up like they do in many of these places? I said to you last week, I said again, when are we going to get serious about being serious, about revival? If you hear of a revival, let me know. I'll be happy to go. We call a crusade a revival. We so many decisions. Go to that town three months after and see if you can find them. You see, men who have got eternity on their eyeballs, as Jonathan Edwards had, men who have seen into the abyss of hell where their worm dieth not, that if, if, if God permits, well, in his will he will, or in his way, if he permits hell to exist for another million years, the people who are there, they never die. It's a second death. Death is separation from God forever. The first death may be cruel, but the second death, when a man dies in agony of soul, it's something entirely different. You know, we're all after quick results. Some of you are Phineites, I suppose. That's okay. 
We know Mr. Finney never, never made an altar call for the first three weeks of any crusade. You don't ever preach in America, dare go to a city. We all go for a one-night stand. There's no scripture that supports that. He preached, 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 preached until people couldn't sleep, until they stopped him in the street and said, Have you no mercy? Don't ask me, but ask God. He preached until their sins came alive. He preached until conscience lashed them, lashed them as though they had some scorpion inside. He preached till their memory haunted them. I said this man through. I preached a great church in Dublin a few years ago. It's right opposite the other theatre. That's where Handel played the Messiah first, by the way. We had this great Methodist church, a conference. I preached one night, I think it was Psalm 51. Three years after I was at a conference, a worldwide evangelization crusade in the north of Ireland. After a meeting, a man came up and said, Do you remember me? I said, No. Remember my wife, don't you? No. You remember preaching in the Methodist church opposite the Abbey Theatre? Oh, yeah, yeah, it's down in Dublin. Oh, he said, I got so angry with you. You know, that makes me so happy. When people get angry, I, I'm, I'm sure I've, you know, hit the bullseye. I went home as a good Methodist, in good standing. That means he was sitting around anyhow. <laughs> and he said, I uh, listened to you that night. You preached on Psalm 51. I remember that. I went home absolutely mad, blazing mad with you. Great. We had our cup of tea and went to bed. My wife sat on her side of the bed and I sat on the other. She said, you know, like these wives do. Get into bed. He said, I didn't. I said, you get into bed. You get into bed. He said, we sat there till after midnight. And my wife said, I need to stretch my legs. So I said, I'll pull the bed away from the wall. And she went round that way and I went round this way for nearly two hours. Suddenly she fell at the side of the bed. My dear, sweet Methodist wife sang in the choir, Sunday school teacher, promoted missions. I didn't know there was anything wrong with her. You know, we preachers or everybody who listens to us is having adultery secretly or stealing us. God's first argument with you if you're a sinner is not that you're, not, it's not that you're bad, it's that you're dead. Yes. Jesus didn't come into the world to make bad men good. He came to the world to make dead men live. When he said, my wife began to cry, God have mercy, I'm a sinner. I didn't know what she meant. She's the sweetest little woman in Ireland. But she prayed and prayed and prayed and wept and wept. And I kept going round the bed. Then he said, and now after I knelt at the side of the bed, and I called out the same. And as you say, Mr. Rainier, we pass from death to life. Ask people if they're saved, they don't know. We'll be very sure they, don't, they aren't. If I carried a hundred pounds on my back and, and I dropped it off, and so they said, uh, did you lose your sack? I, I, oh, I don't know. I, yes, I think. No, no, I didn't. No, 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 it's there. Are you going to suggest when a man gets born again, he doesn't know that the guilt has been removed, the burden has been removed, that now he can look into the face of God and he's not an angry God? Are you going to suggest he doesn't have peace that passes all understanding and all misunderstanding? What do you say, Mr. Rainer, after that? We met some holiness folk down there. Yes, I know Google them, about ten of them in Dublin. It's been so wonderful learning about sanctification, learning about holiness the way that Mr. Wesley taught it. It's been marvelous. And not only that, but you know what's happened? No. He said, we're so happy in the Lord that all our plans have gone. You know, when a man was going to be crucified, he knew a few things about him. He knew when he had a cross on his shoulder, he wasn't coming back. Immediately he got a cross on his shoulder, he knew this, he had no rights of his own. He belonged to government. If you take up your cross, the moment you take up your cross, you've no rights of your own, you've no choice of your own, you've no will of your own. It's all his. Unless you're playing games with God. My wife and I sat down and said, we saw the vanity of this world. 
the emptiness of this world. You see, all the so-called success of this world is only froth cast up by the sea. Have you ever seen the sea washing up and it makes froth? And that's about the durability of all that this world has. If you want it in Old Testament language, it's vanity of vanities. Let me tell you, as an old geezer that I am, there's not one worth thing worth in life worth having outside of Jesus Christ. Yeah. And if you really sing, Thou, O Christ, art all I want, you've got it made. If you really sing that hymn beneath the cross of Jesus, I ask no other sunshine than the sunshine of thy, smell, thy face. You won't care if the world, the flesh, the devil, the in-laws, the outlaws, anybody else frowns on you. If you have the smile of God, what in the world do you care about the frown of men? And if you have the frown of God, what good is the, is the smile of men? Do you know what God's looking for? People who live recklessly for him. Not concerned about public opinion. Not even about preacher's opinion. Becoming a love slave of Jesus Christ. Again, I say, immediately you got that cross, you know that man was going out, he wasn't coming back. Immediately he got a cross, you know he had no right to his own. All his own plans have gone. There's nothing like it this side of eternity. I, mean, I remember the time I got saved. I'm thrilled. I got saved at 14. I was about 18, I guess, when I got... We call the baptism of the Spirit in our group, we call it sanctification, which Wesley calls it. It's spelled out in Acts 15, 8 and 9, where Peter talks about the house of Cornelius. The Holy Ghost came and purified their hearts by faith. See, everybody's seeking power today, not many people seeking purity. You know what your trouble is? You're such a poor image of yourself. That's a devil's lie. Your trouble is you're such a good image of yourself. As soon as you get away with those inflated ideas, how good you are, how useful you are to God, forget it. Do you think he's been holding the world up till you were born? Do you think you're the one that's holding up revival? You could be in your own life and in others. There are millions of people going to hell and what, unless the church of Jesus Christ wakes up, they'll still be going a year from now. I'm sick of sloppy evangelism. I'm sick of reading reports where a good crusade so many were saved. You could gamble your very boots that are the judgment seat of God, Christ. I don't believe 5% of people for pressing Christ in crusades get saved. You think that's hard? Well, get to the judgment seat and see. Do you think the nation could be in this mess unless the salt had lost its savor? The holdup is not Moonism, Mormonism, Communism, Socialism, Romanism, any other rottenism. The holdup of revival in America is the Church of Jesus Christ. We want to resurrection life, but we don't want to die. We want to be filled, but we don't want to be emptied. We want to be clothed, but we don't want to be stripped. Jesus was severe. He said, you can't, unless you leave all, not leave some things, leave all and follow me. This generation of Christians, and that's you, I've had my day. This generation of Christians is responsible for this generation of lost people. You know the nearest mission field to you? Your front street. Amen. There's a precious brother here now. Ah, oh, that is Spencer. Precious brother, full-blooded Indian. I don't know to hear that man prayed and half the preaching in America preach. Two million Indians in America. Do you ever hear anybody having a crusade? No, we all go to Timbuktu. Oh, they're going to have the world uh, soccer matches in Brazil, so we're going to get kids to bleed the church to buy a ticket for them to go there. And all they do is give some things out to people they can't speak to. And there's two million Indians on the conscience of the Church of Jesus Christ in America. Two million. I don't believe there's been a revival amongst the Indians since uh, what well, Lorenzo Dow had it. Do you wonder God says, begin in Jerusalem? It's much more exciting. Your church will get excited. I'm going up the Amazon. 
I'm going right up the Amazon to the Orinoco River. And I'm going 500 miles up the Orinoco River. I'm going up to another river. And there's some Indians there that haven't heard the gospel. You've got some in Oklahoma that haven't heard it. You've got some of the Navajos between here and the West Coast that haven't heard it. Some of the wildest Indians on the face of the earth are on the West Coast of Canada. And the leading sinner of one of the great groups there is the priest. He's the most drunkenly moral man of the bunch. Come on, you guys. Forget about scalping. Get down to some soul winning. Seek God's mind and say, well, I want to know why God isn't taking me to the Indians, taking me to the underprivileged in America. They're going to hell if we don't. And it will be our responsibility. Go home and think about this. You're saved. Your daddy's lost. Have you broken your heart on him lately? Is your daddy going to sit in hell and see you at the marriage supper of the Lamb? And all you do is turn over scriptures and mark scriptures and memorize verses and he's perishing? Why, God's name is your humanity, never mind your spirituality. What about your unsaved brother, your unsaved sister, maybe your unsaved pastor? This is the most serious game in the world, or business in the world. If there was something higher than preaching, I'd go for it. There isn't. It's costly, costs you tears, costs you sleepless nights. I was going to say this, and I'll say it. I don't believe if you live near to God, you'll get overweight. He'll curb your, curb your eating. He'll curb your social life. He'll cut everything down. He'll strip you, strip you, strip you, prune you so that he can get you where he wants you and use you as he, as he likes to do that. Yeah. You won't become a saint by studying your Bible. You'll become a saint by living it. Yeah. Two things to do with the Bible. Believe it, behave it. think how, how they'll stream out of opera houses tonight, loaded with diamonds, loaded with money, and yet they haven't the slightest idea of eternity. Many of them have already chosen a plot of land where they'll be buried. They've chosen the type of casket to be buried in, and that's the full stop as far as they know. They don't know a thing about eternity. God forbid that any relatives of any of us to go to everlasting burnings and have to look out and see us in the bosom of Abraham or in the presence of Christ at the marriage supper. Lord, take their blood off our hands by making us diligent and compassionate. Give us a love that we've never had for the lost. Give us a brokenness we've never had. Lord, why should they obey you when we don't obey you? Why, why should they tremble before you when we don't tremble at your majesty and your holiness? Show us again, Lord, in your own way our personal accountability to a holy God. The privilege of living in a free country like this. The privilege of having a Bible in our hands since we were children and we don't know too much about it. Forgive us that God is remotely distant in eternity. That Christ is a character of a thousand or so years ago. And all the time you're asking him to come and live in us by your divine spirit. Take away our love of the flesh. Take away the, our love for material things. Take our way, our love for the visible, and give us a majestic concept of the invisible. Lord, get our feet out of the mud of time, and give us to live where these precious Puritans and others live, day by day, bowing before the throne of a majestic eternal God, as we sang tonight, immortal, invisible, and God only wise, in light inaccessible. Lord, how terrible it is to think that we be living in the 
in the glory of your holiness. That we'll be sitting down with the greatest saints the world has ever known, with Abraham and Isaac and all these others. And some people who sat in the pew behind us will be in a burning hell with all this corruption, with all the vile, with all the unclean, with the mafia, with the liars, with the prostitutes, with men who die in agony with AIDS, and women who die in prostitution, and people who die calling on false gods. God, give us a sense, a new sense of our responsibility. Give us a new sense of the possibility of sainthood, of spirituality, while we're in the flesh. Give us the joy of knowing how to be crucified with Christ, that we may know his resurrection power and his resurrection life. I pray for the ministries around here that every one of them will receive a new quickening. Lord, I wish you'd trust somebody around here with revival. I wish I could hear that people are not going to bed at night. They can't. They're so in travail for the loss that down the corridors they can hear people weeping and hear people groaning and hear people traveling and have, hear people throwing their lives away, abandoned to Christ. Give us a reckless holiness. Give us a passionate passion for souls. Give us a pity that yearns. Give us a love that loves unto death. Give us a fire that burns.